in this in this time. So uh, let's encourage them as they uh, as they participate. We're going to talk uh, this. Can I say something? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. <laughs> that I Praise am the Lord. here to listen to your song, Lord. I, I couldn't have never picked, or well, I didn't pick it, but God picked it, and it, it couldn't have been any more of a blessing to go through what you just did. I am so thankful for you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And she has come a long way. Last time she had barely made it through. Um, and I know how that feels, but she did a great job. <laughs> but she, uh, she's doing really well. All of our uh, young folks, I want to encourage you, if you're not participating, find a way. If you want to, talk to me. I, I'm not going to make you participate. I don't think that that's the right way to go about it, but I want you to. So please, if you've got something you want to do, Ask me. We'll make a way to make it happen. Uh, we'll support you. This Amen. this <laughs> this church family will support you. We'll support what you uh, what you want to try to do. We started a series after finishing the uh, Revelation Bible study. Uh, started back with a few of these, um, uh, and I titled it. Now that's a good question. Um, I find that people have a lot of questions about uh, the Word of God. They read, they study, and not everything comes easy. And it doesn't matter how many Bible commentaries, how many books you read, um, a lot of it tends to muddy the waters more than clear them. Um, now, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to tell you that I've got all the answers. But I do hope that maybe we can put some things in perspective. And if nothing else, in my rambling somewhere along the line, the Holy Ghost will give you an epiphany and it'll just suddenly come clear to you and you'll say, wow, that was great. And I'll go, good, which part? Because I don't know what I was talking about. But the Holy Ghost knows. And um, we don't rely on me for wisdom. We rely upon Him. For wisdom, we're going to read in the uh, Bible, but before we do, the question was presented to me. Thank, that without a name, and if you want to put your name, that's fine. If you don't want to put your name on it, that's fine too, because uh, however you would like your question. But um, it's not moving. It's not moving. All right, the computer, the sound got turned off. It had really cool writing. I'll just make the noise. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the question was, how are we to look at God's love if we do not trivialize it as a human emotion? We know from 1 John 4 and 8 that God is love. Love is a human construct, therefore God is a human construct. Help! Okay, we live in a time where love has is, is got to be probably one of the most misunderstood words in our language. And when you don't understand the word love in our language, it's very difficult to understand the word love in the Bible. Because we do not come at this from... I don't know any Greek scholars here. Any Greek scholars? How about ancient Hebrew? Anybody fluent in ancient Hebrew? I barely speak English. so. Um, but we do have to understand the words, the terminology, before we can understand the Word of God. So we're going to talk for just a few minutes about, um, about love. And my thought was God's love is it just an emotion? I'm going to take Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 uh, uh, verses 1 through 8, and then verse 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity... I am nothing. 
And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not uh, behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. And verse 13, And now these three remain, faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love. Uh, let's, let's pray. Lord, we've read your word, and God, we're thankful for it. As I've listened this week to individuals from other countries who have had only scraps of your word to hold on to, Lord, we've been given the great privilege, the great blessing of having your entire word right here at our disposal. God, forgive us for not taking, it, taking full advantage of that blessing. But God, as we are assembled here together this evening, Lord, we need your wisdom, we need your insight, we need the anointing and the enlightening of the Holy Ghost to bring clarity to our discussion. Otherwise, it's man's opinion. And man's opinion, like so many other things that we touch, is flawed. But God, your wisdom is perfect and your word is for us to be able to understand and so, God, I pray that you'll grant us this understanding this evening as we work through this together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. First of all, let's define emotions. The definition of an emotion is a natural instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationships with others. Or it is an instinctive or intuitive feeling as distinguished from reasoning or knowledge. In other words, by many people's understanding of an emotion is a feeling. However, if you actually look behind it and look a little deeper into it, they determine that emotions are based on feelings. How you feel. Now, here's one of the problems that I have with this topic. And I, am, I have been reminded, and I must uh, agree, that we are by nature emotional creatures. One of the things that I find unsettling, however, is how much people try to pull emotion into our faith. We are emotional. We cannot get past it. We cannot squash that in ourselves. If you squash that, it actually does you more harm than it does good to get rid, to purge yourself of emotion. The Stoics tried it. The Cynics tried it. In ancient Greek uh, philosophy, they tried to purge themselves of emotion. It's not healthy. God made us emotional. And what He made is very good. So we, who are we to say that we don't, we don't uh, need to have those? However, emotions, as the definition uh assumes or asserts is, is based on feeling. In other words, it is impacted by something outside of you. An emotion, uh, my emotions can be toyed with from a sad song or the very fact that I'm hungry. The other day I had an emotional outburst because three guys called in the same day. I've only got seven guys. And I cover a territory from Table Rock to, uh, to uh, 96 and from um, Toccoa, Georgia, all the way across through uh, the Greenville County School District. Hard for four guys to run territory that big. Three guys called in. It made, it, it made me angry. It made me frustrated. These things impact us. But I can, I can say that the, that outside uh, circumstance or that mood impacts my emotions. Before people spoke of emotions, the word emotion is actually a relatively new term. Back, if you read writings from uh, 
old scholars and people from centuries back, they did not use the term emotion. The word emotion is a scientific term of modern invent. The, they used the term passions. Ever heard the term, uh, word passions? Um, one of the places we've heard it most frequently, especially in Christian circles, is the passion of the Christ. Right? The passion. And now, and, and it's, it's, it's just like this modern, uh, this modern world to take and twist Everything. Passions now simply means uh, we, all, we almost always see it in a romantic um, connotation. Passion is always in a romance context. But the word actually means, it comes from a Latin word, uh, pater, which means to suffer. Passions were sufferings. Sufferings of all kinds. You would suffer jealousy, you would suffer anger, you would suffer rage, you would suffer love, you would suffer... Uh, and, and you can see how those passions... Our passions actually, if you, if you are not very careful, they begin to pull the strings and make you behave in certain ways. In other words, you are at the mercy of your passions. And... Then the Latin was later translated over into um, the word immover, Latin immover, which means to move out, remove, agitate, again to suffer. To suffer an emotion is to be acted upon, to be disturbed, or to be afflicted. Now we take emotions and we make them a lot more pretty than the actual terms were. The Greek, the Greeks who gave us many of these words, which would later be translated over into the Latin, the Greeks feared passions. They were very much in tune with their intellect, their intelligence, the ability to control oneself. And so when they saw these passions or these emotions, most of them they saw as needing to be harnessed or bridled just like you would bridle a horse or else it'd get, it'd get away from you. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? Can we do that? I, I don't mean to interrupt you. No, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's Bible study. We're good. Mm. And I feel it. I mean, I can almost feel my heart hurt. Sure. So what did? What is it that? Uh, I got the impression that you're saying, or that you, or they're saying, that emotion and passion shouldn't. That it's outside. You said something about it being it, outside. Well, stimulated from something beyond the passion itself. The passion is not the end. The passion is manipulated by something. Either a feeling, it could be internal or external, but it's a, it is a, a stimulus outside of the emotion itself. The emotion is simply what comes from the feeling. Give us an example, please. Um, whew. Okay, here is, here, here's one. I don't know how well this will translate over, but I'm bad to blush. So if somebody says something to me, um, I, I, can, I will physically blush. And I can feel the heat rising in my body. The embarrassment, and it feeds itself. The hotter I get, the more embarrassed I feel. 
Do you see what I'm saying? So you've got the passion, which is the embarrassment, coupled with the feeling, both physical and emotional, uh, uh, both physical and mental, the feeling of being embarrassed. It can cause you to cry. It can cause you to shrink inwardly. And so there, you can see that kind of a... They're very closely aligned, but you can see that there is somewhat a feeding of one to the other. <laughs> the word love and all of its meanings show up in the Bible over 300 times. Over 300 times the word love and all its meanings show up. Now that's not counting all the times that love is um, implied or inferred. This is just the actual usage of the term, lo the word love. Um, Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40, the Bible says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Do you not believe that the understanding of love is of utmost importance? Yes. Because the rest of the Bible is pointless without it. It does not matter, as Paul said, whether you can speak with the tongues of men or angels. It does not matter if you have enough faith to move a mountain. Love is the 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 catch-all of the entire Bible, the entire Scripture. Without it, you cannot please God. It's Actually, we're going to get into it. It's impossible to even know God without it. The word translated love in the Hebrew is ahab, or aheb, meaning to have affection for. If you look in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, from which this comes, you find the Hebrew word there. And when the scriptures were translated into Greek, does anybody know what the Greek Old Testament was? What they called the Greek Old Testament, you'll read it in commentaries if you're reading it, it's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint, if you ever run across it in uh, reading, all it means is 70. They believe 70 scholars translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And that's all that word means, Septuagint, 70. Uh, when it, was, it was actually, we find several different forms of or expressions of love. The Greeks were very precise in their language. Um, they have, they, there have been uh, those who would say that the Greek language is the most detailed of all languages that have ever been spoken. It was actually the most grammatically correct of all languages because they actually had words to mean where we have for instance, love, we say we love a hamburger and we love our wife. I love my dog and I love that movie. I mean, see, the words don't compute. They don't translate. But the Greeks had specific or precise words for each different kind of love. There are, there are actually six, but we're only going to touch the, uh, ma uh, the four major ones. Um... The four major ones, Greek words for love, eros loves, uh, it was is sexual passion. It's named for the Greek deity of fertility. You know on all the uh, Valentine cards that you get, the little Cupid? He is actually a Greek pagan god, a deity named Eros. Eros was the one who, was, uh, who shot you with that which would make you passionately in love. The problem was the Greeks feared this love because it definitely caused a... And most of us know that that causes a loss of control. You don't even have to go very far to find figure that out. Just watch television. Watch movies. You can't even hardly watch commercials anymore. Um, this... this uh, it's from this word that we get the word erotic. And this is the filth that is yep. permeating our culture. Yeah, you're saying that, but that's not real love. 
No, it's not love. It was, a, it was one of the forms that we translate love in the English, but the Greek word eros was different. I mean, we, you can't even watch the Super Bowl. I read, I didn't watch the halftime show, I didn't watch the Super Bowl. I haven't seen it, but I've heard enough people talk about it, so I started reading reviews. And even people who are not Christian found it distasteful and vile. Because our society has been given to this. That's what our society has been given to. Many of your authors, many of your early commentators will, uh, will, will, will write, this is dangerous. Is dangerous. This is what Paul was telling Timothy to flee from. Those youthful lusts. Those things that cause you to be out of your own mind. But then one of the things I read, it's odd because losing control is precisely what many people now seek in a relationship. We all hope to fall madly in love. But folks, if you can fall uncontrollably in love, you can fall uncontrollably out of love. Philea, which is deep friendship, deep comrad uh, comradely friendship that developed between brothers in arms who had fought side by side on the battlefield. It was about showing loyalty to your friends, sacrificing for them, as well as sharing your emotions with them. There is a bond that is uh, made between people who share a common, especially a common tragedies, common um, a common battle. This is a deep friendship love. This would be the kind of love that would have been ex uh, expressed between David and Jonathan in the Old Testament. This would have been the sharing of an individual when the Bible said that they had a love that was, uh, was greater than the love of women. It was a love that couldn't, could not be shared by any except those who had been through the same thing. Oh, I watched, uh, we watched a show uh, some time ago, Band of Brothers. It was a, it was a half and half documentary slash uh, 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 motion picture. And those individuals suffered things together that even to this day, as many of them from, the, from World War II, a lot of our veterans from World War II are passing away. We got, but Korea, Vietnam, they shared things that they, that even today still holds them together. They may not even see each other, but those, two, those people are still committed to one another. Let us, playful love, form of love which concerns the playful affection between children, flirting and teasing. It's what many of us call puppy love. It's not real love, it's just a, an affection that's kind of sweet and precious. And then the fourth one is agape love. Now, I believe because the church has got a hold of this, we've tried to wring all the juice out of it, and I think some people see it and they don't even think about it. But agape love is a selfless benevolence, a goodwill, and a willful delight. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, called it the gift love. It is a love that gifts to you and it is the love that you are gifted to others. It is the gift love. It extends beyond uh, mem family members uh, to uh, even to distant strangers. One thing that I read uh, in my study, there is a growing evidence that agape is in a dangerous decline in many countries. Empathy levels in the U.S. have declined sharply over the past 40 years with the steepest fall occurring in the past decade. We urgently need to revive our capacity to care about strangers, to care about others. We live in a Facebook generation where we have friends that we never see. We live in a Twitter uh, uh, generation where we have followers that do not know us. We have, 
we've got more people on the planet and we care less about them than we've ever cared before. All right. So is love a human construct? Anybody ever watch Bambi? He's Twitter-pated. He's Twitter-pated. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. I like being Twitter-pated. I love my wife. Some, day, some days I feel Twitter-pated. Some days I don't. Hello? Yeah. Twitter what are you saying? Twitter-pated. Uh, it's it's off, of, off of Bambi, the Disney, sh Disney movie. The owl looks down at him and he says, they, they're looking at all these little birds and they're lovey-dovey against each other and he says, what's wrong with them? And the owl goes, they're Twitter-pated. That's where the word Twitter came from then, I bet you. I don't know. But they were tweeting and... I don't know. But <laughs> I thought it would have been funny. I didn't... Um, but anyway, there is the human construct. According to scientists, especially anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists, love is a human and societal construct. It is a chemical response of the brain to internal and external stimulus. Whether it is you are hungry and it makes you hangry, whether it, you have heard a song that either lifts you up or brings you down, some kind of chemical uh, in your brain begins to move around and it gives an emotion in response to a stimulus. If you are purely materialistic, then that's the only explanation. If we are truly nothing more than the product of some total of the physical that we can touch, then there's nothing else for you but that. But even these definitions cannot describe why a beautiful woman can love an ugly man. They cannot describe why a mother can sacrifice herself for her children. Who are you talking about? Huh? Who? Anybody. I'm talking about anybody. People, People right broadly. Oh. Uh, a beautiful woman can love an ugly man. No, for what reason? We don't know. Because of chemicals? Why do we feel the way we feel? One, I can hear one song that can make me happy one day and make me sad another day. Why, wouldn't the chemicals react the same way over and over? That's one of the great things about uh, chemistry, isn't it? The, rep, the, rep, the repeatable outcomes of experiments. That's science. That's the scientific method. Some days we're dehydrated. <laughs> okay. But I would submit to you that we are more than the sum total of our chemical reactions in our brain. That was some man or somebody that thought that was sweet. I'm sure. Little kids and stuff don't think that has anything to do with love. Does it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I just put it up there. I, I, I mean, it, it looks like... The Lord hath appeared, is love a human construct? I'm going to say no. And here is why. The Bible says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Jeremiah 31, 3. Everlasting is the Hebrew word, Olam, meaning eternity. If man is not eternal, then love predates man. You know what the thing is though, Pastor Ty? We've taken the word love and cheapened it. It means nothing in most of our applications of it. And just to say earlier, we love hamburgers. Yeah. We love him. I mean, where's the separation? And, but when we're talking about God, we're not loving God as a hamburger or a kitten. Mm. No, that's, the, that's where we've got to recognize that love is broader than the word, than four letters. It's bigger than simply grammar. It's bigger than, we, we, 
The Bible talks about uh, redeeming the times. I believe we need to redeem the Word. It is time that Christians begin to redeem the Word, take back the Word. Folks, I'm, I'm all for taking back a lot of stuff. I'm all for taking back a lot of stuff. I'm, back, I'm for taking back marriage. Marriage means between one man, one woman. Whether or not society likes it or not, it doesn't matter. God defined it. The rainbow. The rainbow does not mean homosexuals. It should not be something that when our kids draw a little rainbow on their paper and bring it to us, we go, ah! Like we're afraid to touch it, like it's a copperhead. The rainbow... The rainbow flag has been utilized to uh, represent the LGBT movement for several years now. And I'm, I'm all for redeeming that. Take that back. That does not belong to them. Neither does the word love. We didn't make it, therefore we cannot define it. The definition has already been made. And the Bible gives us clear instruction on what that is. First of all, the word love predates man. If it predates man, if it is eternal, which God says it is, love is eternal, man is not, then that means that God gave us love. If it originated with God, then only God has the right to define what it means. Not me, not some blogger, not some YouTube video, not some commentary writer. Only God has a right to define a word that He created. Or, in actuality, that He is. <laughs> if reality is compounded, all we have left is make believe. Sure. Sure. So, so, so if everything is a social construct, really everything becoming a social construct is one of the big debates we're having across our land today, politics, academia, and the whole right. thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, they would uh, probably not follow along with you today because they really do believe that love is a social construct. And... Uh, you're exactly right. They believe that love is a social construct. There was a there was a saying um, uh, on a on another Disney movie that said, "If everybody's special, then nobody is." If words mean anything that I want them to mean, then they actually mean nothing. If I can make love mean whatever I want it to mean, then it has no meaning. I'm from the old school that says that I really believe that words have a meaning. And that we should be aware of what that meaning is. When someone is judged and sent to hell, somewhere I believe that God still loves them. He might be angry with them, disappointed and punish them. I don't believe that God can ever quit loving. Right. So love is really off the charts in terms of what we understand. Oh, absolutely. We are, again, like trying to uh, understand the Trinity or trying to comprehend eternity. We're definitely out of our element. It is hard to love. <laughs> yes, it is. At times, it can be. God, let me love you. 
Hmm. Let me love you. That's the one prayer I used to, because I, I knew what I should, but then I couldn't say I love you enough to sacrifice my child. Uh, it, uh, left Behind was really popular at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And I said, I can't, I can't give you my child, uh, you know, uh, I don't, I, I, I can't love you. I, I must not love you. And it took me until I was in my 40s to really have a feeling of giving up everything, everything, and getting emotional reading his words and reading the Bible. Sure. And, and it's hard. It's just hard to, I mean, it's even hard to love your children. Yes, it can be. But see, therein comes, therein comes what we're trying to discuss, and that is separating love from the feeling of love. The feeling of love is completely detached from the love itself. That's kind of like saying, I want to feel brave. Exactly. And, now, and you can walk into a church and everybody be there for just a little while and everybody say, oh, I love you, you know, love you. But you don't get that until you really know God an awful lot and <laughs> love is just in you. It truly is. So you don't believe everybody that says, I love you. I mean, they're just, uh, it's an easy word to say. Right. And that's why it, people have proof that it's just a word. It's not they're cheating. They cheating. Yes. That's exactly. And so now people are more defensive of the word love. And you and teach you your daughter be, not to listen to the boys that say <laughs> that they love you. Let them prove it. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the other day I was thinking about something and I said, uh, us Christians need to take this word back. Um, because the world has changed it and we're talking about love so we're not going to go on this word but to give y'all an example of a word that has been misused <coughs> that is dancing what's the word? will I dancing Dancing. yes will I dance for you Jesus it's a feeling uh, an emotion. I was telling my husband before church that somebody was talking about a daughter, a dad and a daughter's dance. Uh, and I have danced with my daddy many a times and I thought, oh, how I'd love to dance with you, daddy. But love to dance with you, Jesus. That's really deep. Don't cheapen the word. I hope that makes sense. Yes. Now, to understand biblical agape love, we must establish a common ground or a frame of reference. We cannot discuss biblical... You're not going to take this and go out and say, I can define to the world what love is, and they're going to buy into it. This is not a persuasion argument. If you do not accept the Bible as the inerrant word of God, this does, won't apply across. Do you see what I'm saying? Even though it's still the truth, if they don't believe it, they're not going to accept your definition. See, we've got a culture now who, that have already determined that the Bible is not the Word of God, and therefore it doesn't matter what you say. If your argument comes from the Bible, they already dismiss it. And we cannot... So please don't go out there and say, I can win this argument because I know what agape means and now I can make everybody understand God's love. You're not going to because they don't, under, they don't believe the Bible. They don't know what love is. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't know, nor in many cases do they care. But if the scripture is not true, then the definition of love is not true. But if the, if the scripture is not true, then your understanding of love is the least of your problems. 
The definition of love is only confusing when we try to understand it apart from God. If we allow God to be the standard or the baseline from which we gain our definition, then love in all of its degrees begins to make sense. From the lo I love my wife to I love my Lord. I can say those, but I can recognize in the degrees of that love based on God as the standard. But you would die for both of them. I may be willing to die for both of them. The love may be different, but it actually can originate from the same source. All right, so what is God's agape love? Um, am I in the right place? Yes. Agape is characterized by faithfulness, commitment, and an act of the will. The love that is of and from God, it is unmerited, gracious, constantly seeking the benefit of those He loves. To understand love, we must look to the person of God Himself, for God is love. All the definition of love must come from Him. 1 John chapter 4, the entire chapter of 1 John chapter 4, the apostle describes how knowing God is knowing love. If you do not know God, you will not know love. There are people who are not Christian and they love other people. But that is nothing more than the fingerprint, the character, the, the trait that we are made in God's image, it flows to them. That is a natural outgrowth of our being made in God's image. But it is imperfect. It is flawed by our sin nature. So even the thumbprint of God is marred in our life because of sin. So that we love, but we do not love correctly. We do not love properly. We do not love perfectly. Exactly. The only way to love is to know God. The only way to truly love is to, is to know God. In which case, then all the other love that you have begins to make sense. And it begins to move beyond simple chem chemical reactions in your brain to something that is given to you and can be perfected in you. Exactly. God loves because it is His nature and an expression of His being. This is what love looks like. The love looks like the cross. We've got it in the shape of a heart. I've, I find it very fascinating, first of all, that we use a heart for love. The ancient people used to believe that uh, the heart was the seat of emotion, even though it's nothing more than a muscle that pumps blood through your body. Then they put it on Valentine's cards. Folks, your heart don't look like that. I've seen one. They're ugly. Now you want to really... You, I love you with all my heart. And you got this boom, 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 boom. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't think that that would sell many uh, hallmarks. Oh, you know? would too. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. somebody would. Yeah, joke. But this is what love looks like. Love doesn't look like a heart. It looks like a cross. God was willing to do something. His love was more than just, what good would have His love done if it did not impact us? What good is my love for my wife or my children if, it does, if I don't show it in some way? It's just like James said, faith without works is dead. I would say, and I'm not going to add to the Bible, but what Ty says is love without works is dead. I don't believe that you can love somebody without showing them somehow that you love them, that you care for them. I believe that you make your love real by your actions. Just like him suffering, you know, at Easter time, and I, if more than Easter time, I get just really awe because I love him so much. I think about the words that describe the hurt, the pain that he went through. For the sins that I committed, Amen. I can't even imagine what kind of pain. Oh yeah. I know everybody has sinned, <coughs> and he went through all of that. 
And he went through a physical pain, but he went through even more than that. He went through an absolute rejection of God that none of us have ever experienced. That's right. Greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. He did something. I believe that the closer we get to Him, the less fear we will have. And that's not fear of, like, okay, look, this, this morning I came up here and I was going to run a power receptacle in the back for you. So I got, I had my old work clothes on, I crawled up and under the back part of the church. I don't like tight spaces. Especially when I got all the way over here and there's a concrete pad and I was about that far from the floor joists. I can move. The plastic under there started moving. I wasn't moving. I moved quickly. Perfect love does not cast out my fear of snakes. Perfect love does not cast out my fear that there might be a, a, a rat the size of a chihuahua under there. Okay? Perfect love... Doesn't it, that's it casts out first of all it casts out your fear of hell. I believe it casts out the fear that we have oh, that we our relationship is destroyed with God because that love yeah, yeah. yeah it casts out the fear that because I've had that fear I had that real fear that I I would call on the phone and if Courtney didn't answer I'd start thinking I've missed the rapture I'm not even saved what's wrong with me it took a lot of growing it took a lot of of, of but God's love slowly drove that out. It was a crippling fear. An anxiety, yeah. Right. Right. Okay, I'm not going to say that there are not individuals who do not have the need or have some... I believe our body, our entire physical body is impacted by sin, mind and body. I believe that there can be chemical imbalances. I'm not one of these people who says, well, just pray and pull yourself up out of it. Just get over it. The same people would say that are also taking blood pressure medicine. Well, just pray and get yourself over it. See, I, I'm not going to tell you to quit taking your insulin for diabetes, and I'm not going to tell somebody who really has a need to not utilize what we have today by, in, the, in the medical world. But I do believe that God can heal diabetes. I do believe that God can heal high blood pressure. And I do believe that God can heal mental disorders. I do. And until He does, I may have to take medicine. But that does not give me the right or the excuse to quit seeking His healing. <laughs> yep. Everybody with his ABCs and ADDs and all this kind of stuff. And uh, pharmaceutical companies are making a fortune and you're doping up your dog on kids. 
because you're afraid to slap the garbage out of them. <laughs> Well, I, I believe that we should, I believe, that, I believe in healing. I do. I believe in healing. Mind, body, and soul. And I believe that, that perfect love can drive out those anxieties. When we determine what, I believe that love can drive out our sins. When I love Him more than I love whatever it's causing me to stumble, it will drive that sin out of me. Hello? Yeah, that's receiving the Holy Ghost. If, well, I, yeah, but I believe it's also sanctification. I believe it's growing in grace. I believe that the whole package... I, there are some people, they, they love to, to lie. They, they just love to lie. But if, and they've got a, almost a compulsory need to lie. But if you love Jesus more than you love your need to lie, it will eventually drive that need to lie out. Yeah, if, it, it just will. That's honestly that happened. That hit me this week, and you're going, "Duh, brother Ty, how long did you just wake up? You've been under a rock." But it just hit me that way. If you fill yourself more with the love of God than your love for whatever causes you to stumble, eventually His love will drive all that other out. All right, this is. A, you're fine. Go ahead. Yes, some they actually believe that they actually believe their own life. They make themselves into believing that it's the truth. Some of them do. Some liars do believe their own lies. Ephesians chapter two, verse four and five. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. He loved us, so he gave us life. Didn't have to. Didn't have to redeem us. He made man. He could have made man again. He could have wiped it all out and started over. Why did He redeem us? Because He loved us. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gives us, and this is to finish, God gives us the ability to love or agape, through agape love others. We are not capable of loving others in ourselves. Agape love modeled by Christ is not based on a feeling. Rather, it is determined. It is a determined act of the will, a joyful resolve to put the welfare of others above our own. Um, uh, 1 John 3.16 Hereby perceive we love uh, the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He loved us, so we love others. And I put it this way, I seen a thing, it said, And it said, God uses crack pots. <laughs> but the love that He pours into us, sometimes we ask, why don't you fill up the cracks? Why don't you repair me the way I need to be repaired? Why don't you, like Paul said, I besought God three times for a, 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 a messenger of Satan that buffeted me. And God said, no. My grace is good enough for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Besides, your, that love I'm pouring into you is leaking out through that crack. And it's touching somebody else. And praise God, He pours His love into us, not just to contain, but to pour out. And so sometimes the cracks in our vessel are for the very purpose of shedding that blood, or that love, out onto others because you can't do it yourself. 
if, if the Lord ain't pouring in, you ain't, you ain't pouring out. And that's real love. <laughs> so I hope that that answered the question that was given. <laughs> the question the question that actually was given was if love is a human construct then and God is love then God would be a human construct. But if we can tr if we if we look at it scripturally, and we can't look at it any other way. But we're Christians. We don't have to look at it any other way. So, um, anyone else have any uh, thoughts, opinions, questions, hymnals to throw? I don't know if you know, but when we had our little Bible study, we were doing Corinthians. I, don't, uh, I think y'all had mentioned it, but I didn't even think about it. It got, it got me going when I started reading <laughs> Romans and Ephesians and Philippians and Corinthians. That is a good bunch of reading. Doctrine. It is. A solid doctrine. It is beautiful. How many questions do you have? I've got two left. So I'm, I've only got two. So if you've got a question... <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a thing of... of uh, Index cards and leave them out here so that you can write, jot your questions down. It's easier for me to keep up with them that way. I can stick them in my Bible and I can read them from there. Otherwise, somebody says something and about three hours, well, three minutes later, I'm like, what did they say? So, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thanks. God's love surpasses everything that we understand or think we understand. Anyone else? If not, we're going to be dismissed. Thank you for coming out this evening. I appreciate it. And I pray that the Lord blesses you for your sacrifice. Being in the Lord's house can be a sacrifice. Well, He sure did bless me. I got Corinthians Praise God. <laughs> It's it's a it's it and and that's what we want. We want everybody to feel encouraged by being in the Lord's house. So if everyone will stand, we'll be dismissed. Thank you again for.